Thank you very much. It's great to be here. Exciting to see all of you. Uh, thanks for showing up. Um, yeah, so I'm going to be talking about solidarity economy. I just want to say a little bit about this, this uh, presentation. It is interactive. It was, as you can see, it was really co-developed by myself, somebody from the Highlander Center, David Ferris, and Mike Strode at uh, Colonut in Chicago. Um, and um, yeah, we all bring our own experiences with popular education and solidarity economy, so it was a group effort. And there's like many variations of this. This is also totally open source, so you're welcome to have these slides if you feel comfortable doing your own solidarity economy uh, workshop, that's great. All right, next slide. All right, so just this moment, talking about this historic moment that we're in, right? This doesn't come around all the time, right? It's once in a generation, once in two generations moment where there are like these upheavals, there are these crises, and we are in a moment where there are multiple convergent crises. To name a few, these are not exha exhaustive, right? There's the pandemic, there's all the racial justice uprisings, there's climate change in all its manifestations, there's this, this shift, growing shift and movement towards the right and fascism, right? So all these things are coming together and it's pretty, it's pretty dire times and pretty scary times. But at the same time, these crises, and especially like really serious multiple crises converging at the same time, also creates an opportunity. Because people's faith in the status quo is undermined, it's shaky, there are rifts. And there's an opportunity, people are more open to thinking about different ways of doing things. So this is a moment, it doesn't come around a lot. Um, okay, next. Um, so, we're gonna talk about system change and the opportunity to change, to completely change our system. And we're gonna focus in on our economic system of capitalism. But before we talk about capitalism and post-capitalism or solidarity economy, I do wanna talk a little bit about what is capitalism. And we're gonna do a, a workshop tomorrow that will do a much deeper dive into what is capitalism. This is kind of down and dirty, okay? so. If you can get on the Mentimeter, so you have two choices. You could use a QR code with your phone, or you can type in on your phone menti.com and use that number. And you're going to be answering the question, what does capitalism mean to you? What does capitalism mean to you? And we'll, we'll uh, project the word cloud. Hopefully this works. In real time, you'll see the word cloud. Okay, exploited labor, isolation, anti-blackness, anti-indigeneity, oppression, private property, extraction, cancer, death, extractive, end of humanity, private property, status quo, exponential, wow. <laughs> They're coming so fast and furious. Right, so anyway, the bigger they are, the more they've been mentioned. So in the center there, clearly exploitation, cancer, alienation, oppression, extraction, white supremacy. There, there, was, there were some things in there that were definitional, but I wanna offer you a, a definition. And the reason why is, so I, I worked with the Center for Popular Economics uh, for, oh gosh, a member for, I don't know, going on 40 years. Often people would say, oh, capitalism, it's so, con it's so complicated, and, and everybody has their own definition of it. It's just impossible to define, and therefore capitalism becomes this really squishy term, and it becomes a catch-all for everything that we on the left don't like. And that's not, that is not terribly useful. So I want to give you a definition. This definition, the Center for Popular Economics has been using for more than 40 years, so for those of you that don't know the Center for Popular Economic or Economics or CPE, we are a collective of progressive to radical economists. And our mission is to help people understand better how the economy works, um, particularly activists, so that people can be more effective in their work. 
Um, so this is a definition that we've been using for, for all these decades. So it, it does stand the test of time. So you need all five of these characteristics. One alone will not do, okay? So first of all, we have private ownership of the means of production. What are the means of production? Sometimes we call them the mops. The mops are just the stuff that you need to produce stuff. Right? So it's your land, it's your uh, building, it's your tools, it's your inputs, right? Those are your means of production, stuff you need to produce whatever your good or service. The second thing is wage labor. So those are, those are the workers. The workers do not own the means, of, the, uh, the means of production. The workers do not own the mops. Who owns the mops? Those are your capitalists. They're the owners. And the wage labor are the workers. And right there, right there, inevitably, intrinsically, unavoidably, you have class conflict. Why? Because the owners, the capitalists, are, as a system, right, are driven to do the third bullet point, which is maximize profits, very often on the backs of the workers, right? Paying workers less, lengthening the work work day, speed up, etc. And so inevitably, there is this, this class conflict baked into capitalism by its very nature. There's no way around it. There are some, uh, there are some kind, uh, humanitarian, uh, caring capitalists, for sure, that are trying to do the right, right thing. But as a system, as a system, it's driven to, to engage in this class conflict. Uh, so the fourth bullet point is commodity production, which just means you're producing things for sale, not necessarily for use. And often you're producing things that will maximize profits. So the capitalist is pr producing things that will maximize profits. So there are basic needs that don't get produced because they're not profitable. So there's a shortage of a lot of, of generic drugs where the patent has ran, run out, and it's not profitable to, to produce it, but they're really, really essential everyday drugs, and there's a dire shortage, for example. Um, and then the last one is market exchange, right? All of this is mediated through the market, right? Supply and demand and price, okay? So you need all five. I have heard people who work in a worker co-op say, oh yeah, we're a capitalist business because, uh, because, we do commodity production, we, we produce things for sale, and we sell on the market, right? And what they're missing is, in a worker co-op, the reason why they are not a capitalist enterprise is because the workers are the owners. Yeah. That's true. But there are some tendencies, right? If you democratize a workplace, there are some tendencies, right? The, anyway, there's lots we could say about that, um, about why it's a, a step in the right direction. But it won't solve all the problems of the world automatically, for sure, for sure. Yeah. So what we're trying to get here is understanding this mode of production capitalism and these, the, you know, these, the, these kind of five characteristics that you need all together to define capitalism. Okay. Uh, all right. Let's go on. Um, so that gives us at least a simple definition to talk about these two big buckets, capitalism and post-capitalism. I mean, I just find it use, more useful to talk about post-capitalism, what comes after capitalism. You, I mean, to me, it's the same as anti-capitalism, but it's not as quite as, uh, uh, doesn't get people's hackles up quite so much, and maybe that's fun, but I just, in my work, I don't find it so useful. People are, are much more open, I think, in my experience, to post-capitalism. 
but it's the same, right? What comes after capitalism? Um, so capitalism, I do want to say that there are these different paradigms of capitalism, right? There's neoliberalism, which we have now, there's New Deal capitalism, and there's social democracy. Um, so all of these are still capitalism, right? So neoliberalism is the system that we are living under now, right? Sort of uh, cutthroat capitalism, all this, this rhetoric about laissez-faire, free markets, right? It's, there's a huge, huge, huge amount of hypocrisy in there. But anyway, that's the, that's the rap, right? Um, before neoliberalism, we had uh, what we could call New Deal capitalism or Keynesianism, if that means anything to anybody. Sometimes economists like to talk about Keynesianism. Um, so New Deal capitalism came out of the Great Depression, and it was a time when the role of the state was really legitimized, right? The role of the state was to provide a social safety net. It was to regulate businesses. It was to uh, stabilize the economy, right? And that was that was all that was all uh, accepted and legitimate. Um, and then it was overthrown by neoliberalism. Basically, there was a crisis, and it, it sowed the seeds for a paradigm shift from New Deal capitalism to neoliberalism. The third example of another paradigm that I would give is social democracy, so think Scandinavia. So that's like New Deal capitalism on steroids, right? Like super strong social welfare state, the government is much more involved in this, that, and the other, okay? But they're all still capitalism. Um, there might be a little, some people would debate whether some of those Scandinavian countries are actually, uh, maybe they're, they, would, they would think that they're actually a third way or socialism. Uh, I'm not, we're not gonna have that debate. To my mind, I'm saying they're capitalists because the big capitalist corporations still dominate the economy. So, um, all right, let's go to the, oh, oh, before we move on, I just want to make one observation here. So we'll go deeper into what is solidarity economy. Definitely post-capitalist, really clearly, you know, anybody working on a, with a solidarity economy frame is uh, uh, holding the belief that we're not going to get to that more uh, just, democratic, uh, sustainable world by reforming capitalist, capitalism. Very clear about that definitely post-capitalism, but what we do not embrace are authoritarian forms of anything, whether it's state socialism or any other ism. Um, that, are, that principle of democracy is really important. Okay, next slide. Yeah, so if there was a like slogan for neoliberalism, it would be markets good, state bad, but again, lots of hypocrisy. State is called on when it, when it suits the, the corporate interests. Um, yeah, so the rest I think I already talked about. So we can move on. Right, why does it matter? Why does it matter to understand at least the bare bones of what is capitalism? A lack of clarity about what is capitalism means that you can be doing lots of things that feel really good, right? But it's pretty likely that you're just going to be reforming capitalism. You're going to be softening it around the edges. You're going to make, be making it a little bit more humane, a little bit more bearable, and you'll be saving capitalism, right? So an example of that exactly was the New Deal at a time when there was incredible turbulence and there was incredible up, un, unrest and the socialist and the communist movements were, were very strong. And so, uh, you know, the New Deal actually stole a lot of those ideas and then uh, turned it into the salvation of capitalism. So it's something to be careful of, right? Not all things, yeah, if you, if you don't know where you're going in the long run, you're, it's quite likely that you'll end up reinforcing capitalism. Uh, yeah, so clarity helps us make sure that we're working on transformative reforms or non-reformist reforms and an example that you might think about is the Green New Deal, right? Green, it all sounds good, like sustainability, it all sounds good. But like, how is that happening? There's a way in which it could be strengthening democratic collective ownership um, and decision making and spreading the wealth. Or there's a way in which the corporations are just going to capture all of that, all of those opportunities. Okay. All right. Next slide. All right. 
Uh, yeah, all right. So this is a guided uh, visualization. I'm just going to invite you to close your eyes and imagine, imagine that this other world, this better world, your future idyllic world has come to pass. So feel that world a little bit. And imagine that you are walking along or you're, you're headed somewhere, whether you're walking or riding or whatever you might be doing, you're headed somewhere. You walk out your door. What do you see? What do you smell? What do you hear? as you travel along. Do you see other people? If you see other people or other creatures, do you know them? Do you interact? So you're walking towards your destination, observing your surroundings and what's what's under your feet or under your conveyance, whatever that might be. You arrive at your destination. What have you come here to do? What have you come here to do? Whatever that is, sink into that a little bit for a couple seconds. Hopefully enjoy that. Okay, take a deep breath in, breathe out, open your eyes, and um, next slide, we're going to go back to that Mentimeter word cloud, so it's the same link, and now the question is, what values, what <coughs> values underpin that vision that you just had? Right, so community, care, sharing, mentorship, connection, respect, people having time, sustainability, um, joy, reciprocity, solar punk, interconnectedness, egalitarianism, interdependence, love, comfort, ecological, solidarity, bikes, relationships. Okay, couple more seconds, nature. Usufruct, very interesting to be that, for that to be in the center. So to define solidarity economy, um, first of all, it is a, a framework that is grounded in values, right? Those values will look a little bit different, different places in the world, different communities. In the United States, the United States uh, Solidarity Economy Network uses these five. Um, while it might, there might be a little bit of variation here or there, like some of these might be really expanded on, so it might be a much longer list, but when you look at all around the world, when you look at the values that are articulated in solidarity economy, this is a really good common foundation, okay? So first, first is solidarity, solidarity, cooperation, mutualism, reciprocity, et cetera. So that echoes a lot. We, we saw that in the word cloud. Um, the second one is democracy. So democracy in all dimensions. Uh, so politics, work, community. Yeah. Well, when you say democracy, do you include representative democracy or direct democracy? Uh, it's not. It's. It's pretty broad, right? Democracy in all, all kinds of dimensions. And, and, and solidarity economy, what's kind of nice and liberating about solidarity economy is by and large, it's a very big tent, right? And, and uh, there's nobody that's gonna say, oh, you believe that in some places representative democracy is not, you know, is, a, is great, right? It's, everybody's, a lot, you know, you, people have their own views, right? We think democracy is really important. Solidarity economy is not going to arbit arbitrate. This is the right view. This is, you know, 
right? So it's a big tent. We're talking about democracy, a whole bunch of different approaches. People have different opinions. And by and large, that's what I'll say about all of these values. They're very broad. Does that make sense? Well, to me, very clear right. And that's you, and that's great. That's great, great, great. And, and we celebrate. We could have that debate, right? But there are other people that don't agree with you, and so that's great too, right? So like, let's have those conversations. They're rich, they're generative, uh, but we're not going to say, you're right, right? Let's, we're like, there's a diversity. So this last value, pluralism, is super important, right? It means that solidarity economy, there's many paths to the same end of a more just, democratic, uh, and equitable world. There's many paths, and uh, yeah, this kind of, this is the one right path, and this is the one right strategy, and this is the one right definition of, of democracy, is not what solidarity economy is about. And at some point, in reality, there might, it might come down to some real world struggle. Like when we have that power, right, it might come down to, or, or on a microcosm, there might be a real world struggle, right, where you need to choose one or the other. And then you have the debate. But solidarity economy as a big framework is not going to say, yeah, you're right, you're wrong, right? It's not, not going to happen. So, um, equity, equity in all dimensions, so anti oppression. Um, Equity, race, class, gender ability, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. Okay. Um, sustainability, don't think we need to uh, define that. And I already talked about what is pluralism. So in the words of the Zapatista, it's a world in which many worlds fit, right? Like that is so important because it prevents us from getting all dogmatic and being at each other's throats with like the one pure way, right? Okay, so those are the values. Let's go to the next one. Um, so I'm going to put it all together now. This definition both comes from the U.S. Solidarity Economy Network, USN, and RAPES. So RAPES is the International Solidarity Economy Network. So it's a network of network. There are solidarity economy networks and organizations that are part of RAPES on every continent in the world except for Antarctica. But I understand those penguins are pretty cooperative. So we're working on them. So that's RAPES. Repes went through a two-year international consultation process, and uh, to to because there was so much, it's such a big tent, and there were so many different definitions of solidarity economy, and will continue to be different definitions. But we wanted to establish what is the common foundation that we can all agree on. So this is this is what we came up with. It is number one. It's a framework, right? It's a framework. Just to say, let me let me just get through this. Uh, it's a framework that connects solidarity economy practices and, of course, the people who are, are the practitioners or the proponents or the organizers, okay? So it's a framework. It connects solidarity economy practices. Solidarity economy practices are aligned with solidarity economy values. We already talked about the values. And all of this is to articulate a post-capitalist world. Right, so yes, a post-capitalist economy, but solidarity economy would also be talking about economy in a much larger sense, like harking back to the original definition of the word, which in Greek means management of the household. So how are you managing your local economy or your local world? How are you managing uh, how, you're, how you're living, right? Um, so. That's the definition, framework, practices, val aligned with values, all definitely, clearly, post-capitalist. Uh, just an indication of uh, the global movement. So I mentioned repess already. Just a couple other indicators. The International Labor Organization runs an annual Solidarity Economy Academy. The UN has a task force on the solidarity economy, and they just came out with uh, some procla proclamation about the importance of solidarity economy and 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 uh, you know integrating it into all these UN approaches. Um, it is enshrined in the constitutions of two countries, Bolivia and Ecuador, and there are a bunch of countries, maybe a dozen countries that have national uh, solidarity economy policy frameworks, which basically direct the government departments to support solidarity economy. So there's a lot of there there, there's a lot of legs, 
And um, yeah, there's a lot to build on. Okay, I saw a hand over there. Oh, yeah. Yeah. From, like, large foundations. Yeah. Yeah. So, I, I mean, that is up to everybody, right? There's nobody from on high who's doing anything, right? There just isn't, right? And so it's up to anybody who wants to work in a, uh, you know, sort of with a solidarity economy framework or organize your own local solidarity economy, this or that, or whatever. Organize your own uh, solidarity economy ecosystem. That's up to everybody to take that responsibility. That is always, always, always a danger. Always co-optation. So clarity is one of the best inoculants against co-optation. So knowing, like capitalism, that's one example, right? Like so to deepen your understanding of what is capitalism, to make sure that you're not, you're not just supporting a nice, benevolent, capitalist this or that, for example. But lots of other ways in which it could be co-opted. Co but uh, important to, yeah, important to always be thinking about that. I am going to try to get through this um, and then do the small group breakout. So, is that okay? So go ahead. What, where does democracy and politics fit into a cooperative? Yeah. yeah. How, how do those things kind of hold up, become a holistic? Uh, right. In a cooperative. To make those things real. Yeah, right. in a cooperative, like Real yeah. Yeah. I'm not sure what to say about politics if what you mean is like the bigger politics. I don't mean statecraft. No, but just like your political analysis, worldview. Political uh, culture. Yeah, right, right, right. So, uh, 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 hard to say, right? There's just so much diversity, right? There are some co-ops, and they're co-ops because they don't want a boss and they happen to be organized as a co-op, they're not particularly into social change or transformation, they're not particularly radical. Fair enough, right? Like, I, I'm like, fine, that's fair enough. You have a different way of doing it, it's not capitalist, right? You're not, you know, you, your business is not committed to this, fair enough. And there are other uh, co-ops that, really, that are really there. Part of the work is to try to bring, to build that critical ma uh, mass. Uh, so I would say worker co-ops are by and large that center of gravity is pretty uh, progressive to radical. Uh, things like um, producer co-ops, so for example, agricultural co-ops, forget it, right? Land of lakes, ocean spray, right? But they're co-ops, right? There is a democratic element, right? And some Co-ops are really like they're, uh, they have a really flat structure. They're completely horizontal, uh, but most of them have some hierarchy. Um, and if they're big, they have some kind of representative democracy. But there's a huge variation. And again, for solidarity economy, we're not going to arbitrate that, right? Like, there's a lot of different pathways. And in the real world, people can struggle and debate, but it isn't for a solidarity economy to say this is right and this is wrong. Does that make sense? Yeah, but I, I, I do think we have to be very clear. You know, the meaning of democracy, economy, and politics. Uh, so there's always going to be some kind of democratic process going on. It might not be the same kind of democratic process that you would like to see in a co-op, right? There's going to be some, unless they're just uh, completely out of line with their bylaws and, just, and their structure. Democracy is. I know. There's lots of different kinds of democracy. I'm sorry, I don't want to I'll yeah. take over, but, but yeah. just imagine you, this. you have a, a cooperative that is controlled democratically um, within the cooperative, say, grocery store. You know, you have a, a grocery store where everybody wants to buy it. It's a consumer co op, so workers are workers. It's, worker co-op is different from a consumer co-op. So a consumer co-op, the consumers who shop there, who are members of, say, that food co-op, they're the ones with the decision-making power, not the workers, unless it's a hybrid, right? But there are very few hybrids where both the workers and the consumers own the food co-op, right? So it is, definitely isn't democratic for the workers. Yeah, so worker co-ops are much more easy, right? 
worker co-ops, the structure is they workers have a voice. But it might be right voting for the voting for the board and then the board appoints the 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 director. Right? So there's lots and lots and lots of different structures. It, yeah, so anyway, I'm gonna uh, great conversation, happy to have it afterwards, but maybe we we should move on. Yeah. Lots of different approaches to democracy and lots of different yeah, okay, so let's see, where are we? We can move on from this. Um, yeah, so just imagining solidarity economy in your life, right? Um, instead of capitalism, solidarity economy, instead of a police state, transformative justice, instead of a monopoly, we have community control, instead of a boss, we have worker owners, instead of landlords, we have community land trusts uh, and co-op housing. Instead of a bank, we have credit unions. Credit unions, by definition, are a form of a, of a co-op. It's a consumer co-op, um, even though they might not feel like it, right? Yeah. Um, instead of representative, may we have participatory democracy or de direct democracy. And instead of landlords, may we have tenant unions. Um, OK, let's see. Next one. So this is not exhaustive. Um, and again, you can have a copy of these slides and look at all these examples at your leisure. But these are economic spheres. So as an economist, so I, these are like the main economic spheres of production, reproduction, distribution, exchange, consumption, finance, and governance. Okay, so there are the, all these examples like worker co-ops, DIY, right? So solidarity economy absolutely would embrace um, non-monetized um, economic activities. So absolutely care work, for example, non-monetized, non-paid care work is definitely something from a solidarity economy perspective that is really valuable um, economic activity should be treated and supported as such. Um, uh, and if you did have to pay for child care and elder care and all that kind of stuff, it's, it, it's expensive. Uh, so that's one thing that I want to point out um, about unpaid care work. The other thing I want to point out is um, under governance, well, like some of these things are keepers, right? Um, for example, public schools, right? Some of these practices are ancient, right? A lot of cooperative practices, in fact, he, the human beings as a species would not have survived, period, without cooperating, whether it was like a formal structure or not, right? This is the history of, of humankind, right? And so all throughout histories of all our peoples, we engaged in cooperative endeavors. Um, so it's ancient, ancient, ancient. Um, so some of it is old, some of it is newer innovations, newer forms and structures. Some of it is quote unquote alternative, but some of it is quite mainstream. And in any case, if you look at all these examples, and this is not an exhaustive list, there's a huge foundation to build on. Um, a huge, we're not starting from scratch. Okay. Next slide. Uh, yeah, this is just a summary, like YSE. So yeah, I mean, it's a big tent. It's pluralist. I just think that's so important. Um, it's clearly defined in terms of capitalism, whereas a lot of other approaches, donut economics, community economics, green, um, new, next, they're very vague uh, and, and often deliberately vague because they're scared. They're scared to have the conversation about what is capitalism. And I think it's really a mistake. I, I mean, I think we have proved that we can have that conversation and come away with it with people who are gonna still believe that we can reform capitalism Right, and that that's a that's a position, right? And we can still be friends, right? It's it's important to be able to talk about these things. Uh, yeah, so we're clearly defined, and there's a, a growing global movement. Okay, next slide. Okay, so I just want to leave you with this metaphor about imaginal cells. So when a, a caterpillar spins its chrysalis, its body starts to break down into this nutrient-rich goop. And in that group are these things called imaginal cells. And those imaginal cells have a different imagination of what it could be. And it's so foreign that what is left of the caterpillar's immune system starts to attack those imaginal cells and starts to kill them. But some of them survive, and then they start to find each other, right? They recognize 
uh, they have some something in common, a common vision, a common imagination. They start to find each other. They start to clump. They start to fend off and survive the attacks of the immune system. And then, as they continue to clump, they start to specialize. So some become an eye, and some become an antenna, and some become a leg, some become a wing, until it emerges as a butterfly, a completely metamorphized, morphosized, whatever it is, changed um, a creature. So what's nice about this this metaphor for solidarity economy, I feel like if you think back to that slide with the economic sectors and all these examples, those are like imaginal cells. And uh, they are not, they are not capitalist. They're uh, stepping stones, maybe. They're stepping stones, so they could be a stepping stone to a whole new transformed system. Um, but right now, they're isolated, right, and not connected, not clumping. A little bit of clumping is happening, but mostly isolated. And therefore, don't add up to a whole lot. Like, oh, there's that cute co-op, and there's that cute CLT, and oh, look, there's a social currency, right? And so solidarity economy is all about providing that framework, that skeleton to try to pull it together and, and create a, a system, right? Um, so that's, that's solidarity economy.